So the strip deformation construction for PSL2R gives all the examples of proper affine actions of free groups on the Lie algebra of SL2R with linear part acting by the adjoint representation. Um, you could ask the same question for other Lie groups. Um, any Lie group can act affinely on its Lie algebra via the adjoint action for the linear part and standard addition of Lie algebra elements for the translation part. Um, so Elias Milga has a result in this direction. It's an existence result for proper affine actions. So for any real Lie group, um, non-compact, semi-simple, then if you look at the Lie algebra in the action I was describing before, you can find a non-abelian free discrete subgroup of the affine group that acts properly on the Lie algebra. And this is a, a true action of the group G and not some construction where you take a smaller Lie group and embed it into a bigger Lie group and then say if you had a proper action before, you have a proper action in the big group. Um, it's a true action of G and this is what the Zariski density hypothesis tells you basically. Um, we'll be interested in constructing more examples of these affine actions of Lie groups on their Lie algebras um, that are proper and um, doing a bit more than just showing existence, maybe hoping to classify or obtain more results similar to the ones of Densiger, Gerito, Kessel in the PSL2R case. So first I'll have to describe the, the class of linear parts that we'll be looking at. So in, in PSL2R for linear parts we were only looking at um, holonomies of hyperbolic structures, and this gave us a lot of tools to work with. Um, for the linear part here, we'll be looking at SP2NR. This is motivated, if you want, by the fact that SL2R is SP2R as well, so in higher rank you might want to look at SP2NR. Um, and the we will take groups which play ping pong in projective space in the same way that SL2R plays ping pong in H2, but also on the boundary of H2, which is projective one-dimensional space. So you, you take a symplectic form on R2n to be able to define your symplectic group. And then we want a notion of a good subset of projective space that we will use to play ping pong and will give us a, a bit more structure than if it were an arbitrary subset. So you take a convex subset and you define its dual C star. Um, so because we have this symplectic form, we can identify the dual projective space of hyperplanes with the projective space itself using the orthogonal complement. Um, it's not really an orthogonal complement in this case. In fact, every point is contained in its orthogonal, so just the orthogonal subspace. Um, so C star is just the set of points in projective space which are um, so that their orthogonal is completely outside of the closure of C. And we'll say that a subset is reflexive if its double dual is equal to itself. Um, so an example of a set like this is given by just a simplex um, in projective space. I'll show a picture. So this is a simplex in projective three space together with its dual. So you think of the simplex in the middle. That's my convex set C and C star is the union of those two pieces which are in fact connected through infinity in projective space. And what I wanted to show is that if you make the subset smaller, its dual becomes bigger. And in fact, as your convex subset converges to a single point, its dual will converge to the complement of the orthogonal of that point. So to everything minus a hyperplane. So back to the slides. Um, now we will take um, 2k reflexive convex sets, just like when playing regular ping pong, but the condition, instead of just asking them to be disjoint, we want to ask that any two of them, c, c prime, um, satisfy the condition that the closure of one is inside the dual of the other. And then you take group elements that map the dual of ci minus to ci plus. 
And you call the group generated by these things a projective and of Schottky group. Um, I'll show a picture example again. So here, what you see are four tetrahedra like in the, in the previous picture I showed, and they are all contained in the dual of all the other ones. So I'm talking about the four big ones here. And then we chose some elements of the symplectic group which map the dual of this tetrahedron to this one, and another generator which maps the dual of this tetrahedron to this tetrahedron. And then what I drew, the smaller tetrahedra that you see inside, are just the images of these four by the generators. So this is like the first generation of the Schottky group. And if you applied length two words, you would get smaller tetrahedra inside of each one. Maybe spin around a little bit. So you can see the picture better. There you go. So these groups have the following properties. So by the ping pong lemma, you can show that they are free groups. Um, they are always P1 and Ozov, for those who know what this means. Um, so P1 and Ozov representations have lots of good properties. Um, the first one is that they form an open subset of the representation variety. So if you deform a little bit, you still have this P1 and Ozov property. And also they have good limit sets. Um, so in the case of these ping pong Schottky groups, you can see what the limit set is going to be. So the, the convex sets get smaller and smaller as you apply longer and longer words, and in the limit they will converge to some Cantor subset of projective space. So the, the Anasov Schottky groups, as defined here, form an open subset of the space of P1 Anasov representations. This is also fairly easy to see because um, you can actually use the same um, convex set if you just deform the representation a tiny bit and they will still satisfy this open condition of being contained in each one's uh, opposite or dual subset. Um, and using their dynamics and projective space we can actually um, construct a funda fundamental domain for uh, co-compact properly discontinuous action on a subset of Lagrangians. So by a theorem of Guichard and Wienhard, we know that um, a P1 and Ozov subgroup of the symplectic group admits a domain of discontinuity in the space of Lagrangians. And we can construct a fundamental domain for that action using um, these, uh, these um, reflexive convex sets. Essentially, to each reflexive convex set, you associate a half space, which is all Lagrangians that intersect this convex set. Then when you remove all of these half spaces from the space of Lagrangians, what is left is the fundamental domain. So it's really an, an analogous strategy to building a fundamental domain for a Schottky group, say in the hyperbolic plane, or in hyperbolic space in general, where you remove half spaces and whatever's left is a fundamental domain. So then the idea to construct um, proper actions on the Lie algebra will be to well, do the same thing as the key insight that I said before. So the key insight was that um, a co-cycle in SL2R it act will give a proper affine deformation if it corresponds to a deformation of the corresponding hyperbolic structure, which is lengthening. So here, because we don't have the hyperbolic plane, but we do have an analog of its boundary, um, so the, the projective space on which the symplectic group acts is the generalization of the boundary of H2. And when you make a, a generator or an element um, have a longer translation length in H2, what you're doing is making it more contracting in projective space. So Co-cycles for representations in SP2 and R should give proper actions if they correspond to deformations of a representation which make every element more contracting or contract stronger in projective space. So we'll try to define generalized strip deformations, which just like 
in um, just like in H2, we wanted to add strips to make every closed curve longer. Here, we're going to add some type of strip to make every element uh, contract stronger. So you, you choose one of these properly convex sets. When you have a convex set in projective space, you can lift it to a cone in R2n. And actually, this cone will have two components. So you just choose one and call that C tilde. Um, then the translation semigroup associated to the, to the convex set in projective space is the relative interior of all elements of the Lie algebra, which map the lifted cone inside itself. So you, here you think of the Lie algebra elements as endomorphisms of the vector space. So they can actually act directly on vectors. You can ask that this condition is satisfied. Um, and then you want to remove the boundary. So this is why I write um, the relative interior of this set. So this is not an open subset of the Lie algebra, but what you want to do is take its interior inside the smallest vector subspace, which contains the cone. So this is a subset of the symplectic Lie algebra, which you want to think of as elements which infinitesimally send C inside itself. Um, the translation semigroup is related to the translation semigroup of the dual by the following relation. So if you, if you take the dual set, you get the negative of the translation semigroup. By the way, this is not always non-empty. So if your convex set is sort of not symmetric enough, you might have no infinitesimal way of mapping it inside itself. But for instance, for the examples that I gave before, the tetrahedra, those have um, fairly large translation semigroups. So then our first theorem is that if you have a projective anazov schottky group as described before, so think of the, the four tetrahedra in the picture that I gave before, then you choose for each attracting tetrahedron an element xi inside the translation semigroup. So think of this as being a tangent vector to a path of representations which map the tetrahedron strictly inside itself. Then the co-cycle that you get, which to each generator um, assigns this element, will define a proper action of gamma on the Lie algebra. And so the reason is essentially, well, the philosophy bef from before, that if it sends a tetrahedron so before it mapped the dual of one tetrahedron to another, now it maps the same dual of the first tetrahedron to a strictly smaller tetrahedron, so it's contracting stronger. When you do these proper affine actions, um, we understand them explicitly enough to also be able to construct fundamental domains for them, which are bounded by hypersurfaces, um, which generalize the crooked planes in SL2R. The, the proof that the action is proper um, uses an analog of the properness criterion in SL2R, um, except you replace the translation length by the largest eigenvalue or the log of the largest eigenvalue. So um, here's the statement. It's exactly the same statement as the one for the, for the SL2R case, except we've replaced the translation lengths that were here by logarithm of the largest eigenvalue. Because we're assuming that the linear part is P1 and Osov, we know that rho of gamma for every element gamma has a unique real largest eigenvalue. It's, a, it's biproximal in projective space. And then we measure how much more contracting each element of our group is, and or how, how fast it's getting more contracting because this is a derivative. And if this is bounded away from zero, then the affine representation acts properly on the Lie algebra of SP2NR. Notice that this is not an if and only if. So the theorem in SL2R, actually the hard direction is the opposite direction. So here we only have the implication that if this is bounded away from zero, then the action is proper on SP2NR. And in fact, we have counterexamples to the to the opposite direction. So 
um, there are proper actions for which this quantity is not bounded away from zero. We might need a finer invariant than this one if we want to characterize precisely the proper actions. Um, so uh, in the title, I talked about actions on SP2 and RNS Lie algebra. So I won't have time to say much, but there is a way to see the action, the affine action of G semi-direct product with its Lie algebra on its Lie algebra as an infinitesimal version of the action of G cross G on G by left and right multiplication. And uh, Densiger, Gerito, Kessel, in their papers, they do um, use and formalize this idea through geometric transition. And they show that, in fact, when you have a proper action on the Lie algebra of SL2R, it comes from um, it comes from a proper action of G cross G on G by taking its derivative. Um, so the, this philosophy seems to carry through to SP2NR. Um, in fact, so you can find an analogous strategy to the one that I described before to define proper actions on the Lie algebra, but to define proper actions on the group itself by left and right multiplication of SP2NR times SP2NR. And you do generalized strip deformations. So the same thing I said before, except instead of ta taking tangent vectors to the group which map the convex set inside itself, you take group elements which map the convex set inside itself to make every element more contracting. And then you get a proper action of G cross G on G. We also define generalized crooked planes in SP2 and R which cut out fundamental domains for these proper actions. Uh, thank you for listening to the talk. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was understandable. I will be part of a joint office hours on Zoom together with Giuseppe Martone and Ariel Leitner at 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Thursday, June 4th. I'll be happy to answer all your questions. 